And if you don't mind, grab a handful of that stuff up there and make sure everybody has one. A copy. one. Leave me one. I do. And just give one to couples. I don't want to fight them over it, but hug them, Chase. You're not a couple, you don't get one. Okay. I'll play five. He's five like years. me, he's almost a couple. <laughs> are you are? Right? You're just one and a half. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to let this couple sit in my car apart. I'm going to let you share that. That's all right. There was an older couple driving in their car and they pulled up behind a young couple at a traffic light. They saw that, that they saw just a silhouette, two heads together, and they was all scrunched up, all loved up together in the in the car in front of them. And the old lady said, uh, you know, we used to sit like that. And the old man said, I ain't moved. <laughs> there's going to be a test on this, so uh, no, there's not. Let's look at uh, Matthew chapter 24 in the Power Bible. Andy? Uh, Matthew, if you want to turn your Bible, you can juggle that piece of paper. That's actually two pages. But it's all one big, uh, all one big graph. It's a Clarence Larkin in words instead of pictures. If you want to know what the Bible teaches about something, the best place to learn is not by listening to preachers and teachers. You know? The Word of God is not going to change. It only says one thing. So you kind of got it nailed down, you know? Uh, it's going to stay place. And then preachers change their mind and change their, their viewpoint and their opinions. And, and uh, there's every flavor in the world. So, many years ago, I began to have doubts about what I believed about the second coming of Jesus. I began to read some things and hear some things and uh, that directed me, that, that didn't point me to a graph or a picture on the screen, but it, it, it pointed me to the Word of God. Give me a little bit more volume. I feel like my voice is, for some reason, boy, we went out to Dots today out in Hillsborough. Now, have you ever ate there at Dots, Soul Food? Well, I think I hurt myself. And I had never been there before. Go to Dots. Way out, way out to we go out to the shack sometime now, and Florida is like, I don't think God even knows where Florida is at. I don't know. There's food you know God knows where <laughs> Just home cooking, man, and just uh, two, two, uh, a meat and three, and meat and two, or just vegetables like Terry does. Boy, there was lots of folks there, too, but every shade and color. Thank you. Uh, Instead of pointing me to books or to a particularly astute teacher or a prophet, uh, I found books that say, you know, look at where the Bible is. You know, take me to the take me to the Bible. So this is just re this is really just simple to me, and, it, and it, to me it just seemed like it, well, it wasn't. Uh, it's not new to me. It's not a method that I've invented by any means. But it's just so simple, and it makes so much sense. I talked with you this morning about translations. And I, I, I'm not afraid of those. And I, uh, there are good and bad translations. Or not, there's, really, there's really only a few, what I would say, just very, very poor translations. And they're generally done by people who are, who are presenting a copy of the Word of God or an edition that, that has been changed or edited to support their view or their belief system. That, that's, really, that's really a bad thing to do. So, if you, want to, if you want to say, what does the Bible teach about the second coming of Jesus? There are 11 passages in the New Testament. Of course, of course first of all, you couldn't have, don't you? Uh, now, there's a, there's, a lot about, there's a lot of prophecy in the Old Testament. And, and uh, there's, I guess a lot of people would say there's a lot of information in the Old Testament about the second coming. But really, uh, it would be very veiled and 
kind of shadowy and, and uh, symbolical. And so if you just want really just clear teaching, is this is what Jesus' return is. Jesus came, his first coming was when he was born in Bethlehem's manger. His second coming is, is going to be yet in our future. So there are 11 passages in the Bible that seem to be clearly of physically describing, not, not you know, in a symbolical way, but talking about, man, he is literally, physically, Jesus is coming back. There are 11 places in the Bible, in the New Testament, so you can say, let's not look, let's not try to figure out some of the questionable uh, or less direct passages of the Old Testament. Of course, a great deal of uh, much of the Old Testament really is in preparation for the first coming of Jesus, and so it's, it does talk. It does refer some a great deal to his, his second coming too. So let's go to the Bible, and that's what this page is. There are eleven columns in the page that I gave you. There are eleven columns, sorry. And it starts, it tells you where they're at. There's Matthew chapter 24 and 25. And then it has a column underneath that. Acts chapter 1. There's only a few entries there, but and uh, there's kind of an indirect reference to Jesus coming. We're going to close that today tonight. And then in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 Thessalonians 4, 2 Thessalonians chapters 1 and 2, and then the book of Revelation is really, we know that the book of Revelation is about the end time, and it's about prophecy, it's about the end of the world, it's about the coming of Christ. And so, what I learned uh, many years ago is that the book of Revelation tells tells the story of the coming of Christ and it tells it six times. It'll, it'll start at a certain place and then it'll go up to the coming of Christ. And then it'll, it'll start over again. It'll start at another place. And you know there are uh, the breaking of seals on the document in the book of Revelation. There's the blowing of trumpets and then there's the uh, pouring out of vials. So there's breaking of seals. There are six of those. And uh, then there are six trumpets. And then there are vials. But all three of those really are describing the same thing. And the story of the description Jesus is dis described in Revelation six different times is, is coming. So he's not coming six different times. But he's just saying, let me tell you again in a little different way. So it's called recapitulation. Hey, we don't need to know that as a word, but I just want to let you know that if you're reading the book of Revelation, he says, well, I thought, I thought Jesus had already come back in chapter 6. And yeah, well, then this is, it, he just tells it, and then he tells it again, and he tells it again. And so it's told over and over again in different ways. So you're not going to have uh, a bunch of seals broken, and then next, a bunch of trumpets sound. No, it's, they're the same thing. And I've got, I've got another piece of paper that takes the so he opens the trumpets and the vials and puts them on columns just like this and compares how they, what happens when he opens the first seal. Well, it sounds an awful lot like what happens when the first trumpet blows. I mean, an awful lot. And then you, if you follow that on through with every one of the, those things, you say, well, it's really, just really a different way of saying the same thing. Now, what I have here is showing words, phrases, ideas, and figures of speech that appear in all 11 that are alike. Let me just, uh, this is just for you to kind of take out, if you have any, if you care, we're not going to go over this, but I, I thought if you want to look, when you're talking about the, the second coming of Jesus, you're going to have that the Bible says that people are going to see it. And that seems to be the, and he, they beheld him, or behold, uh, he was coming in the cloud. You know, something that, that says, in, in, not in every, they're not all the same. All 11 tellings are different. But there's enough similarity among all of them that seem to give a very clear indication that they're all talking about the same thing. They're all talking about the second coming of Jesus not about some other coming, the, the first coming or the third coming, that they're all describing the very same thing 
And as a matter of fact, it's what's going to happen next. The gospel is going to be preached throughout the world. People are going to be saved. People are going to be born and people are going to die. People are going to be saved and baptized. And then Jesus is going to return. That, that's the schedule. Nothing else, nothing more complicated than that. You're going to see that there are angels. Not every one of them mention angels, but God uses it. If, if, when you will be able to know, when you start seeing angels in the sky, or angels around you, that we're in gear, where things have started. The trumpet, the last trumpet, or the, or the blowing and sounding of the trumpet, is mentioned in a lot of them. A shout, or the voice of the archangel, is mentioned in quite a few of them. And you can see it as it goes out right there. For instance, let me just pick one out. In verse 27 of Matthew 24, it's the fourth line down, you see it talks about coming in Acts 1. In Thessalonians, it says the coming of the Lord. When He shall come, He cometh. The great day is come. And so and so forth. You're going to see that a lot of these stories talk about thunderings. Thunderings. About four or five of them says it thundered. About four or five of them says that there was a great earthquake. And, there, and another phrase that you see is there were lightnings. In some of them it says the moon turned dark or the moon changed or the sun went dark. It talks about different things that happened in the heavens. We've already mentioned the, the, the trumpet and about the shout. And there's a, a gathering, or it says they were caught up. Uh, the angels went out and snatched people up. So you can see, if you can follow one, like you're the very last one on the list, it says life eternal. In 1 Corinthians 15, it talks about immortality. In Thessalonians, it says so they'll be ever be with the Lord. And you can just follow around. In some places, there's hell. In the very last line there, you said there's not anything in the bottom. But in, in all... Uh, but one, the, from the Revelation 6 on, it, it talks about the wrath. Wrath is to come. The wrath of God. Fierce wrath or the wrath of a God. So, there are common phrases, common words. Things that they share. And it talks about the unrighteous being judged. The righteous being carried on to, to eternity to, to be with the Lord. It talks about clouds. He's going to be coming in the clouds, and the clouds will part, and He's coming with the clouds. So there are many different things. And so what I did is I took every place in the Bible that talks about the second coming. And then I just, you can follow them out like a chart and see where they match up. And they're not, as I said, none of them are exactly identical. But when you look at all 11 of them, it, as a group, as telling one story, there seems to be enough evidence there that it's, t that it's not talking about two different or three different events. It's all talking about when Jesus comes back. Now, if you are here with me in uh, Matthew's Gospel, chapter 24, let's look at verse 1 there, Andy. Matthew 24, 1. Now, this is the Olivet Discourse. And so let me show you what the Olivet Discourse is, chapter 24 and 25. And this, uh, he was on the Mount of Olives. That's why it's called the Olivet Discourse. The, 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 the teaching on the Mount. And Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. Now, he'd already he'd seen the temple all of his life. But, you know, it's like, I tell you, if, uh, if you ever go to see the Eiffel Tower, or you go to see uh, the dome of the rock on the temple mount you'll, you'll all stand there and say look at that look at that and everybody said yeah I'm, I've seen it yeah, I'm looking at it but uh, you know it's just uh, and that's what they were doing they said they're all from the country they're from Galilee man that's that's redneck city out there they lived out in the country and so they're here in town they'd all seen it too but they'd never and they'd seen it with Jesus before but they just they were in that kind of mood where they said man look at that and Jesus said to them, you see all this stuff? See all these things? They were really impressed by it. They, were, they, they just thought, you know, they lived in little bitty huts. There's a, a temple, man, a huge monolithic structure. See all these things? Verily I say to you that there shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. Man. <laughs> Talk about the power of positive thinking. 
Sometimes uh, Jesus didn't always talk upbeat. Sometimes he just said things that need to be said and things that we need to know. You need to say things that are more encouraging. You sound so down in the mouth. Oh, look at this a temple. Jesus said, yeah, it's all going to be torn down. It's all going to be What? And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming? and of the end of the world. All right, now look at that. Boy, that's it. The disciples sometimes didn't know what to say. Often they didn't know what to ask. That never did stop them from saying something and never did stop them from asking for something. So that's all right. I do that too. Of course, in modern English, it's like clue us in. Yeah. They said that they had three questions. So they were referring directly. Jesus said, this is all going to be torn down. Not one stone will be left upon another. And they came and said, okay, when is this going to happen? What is going to be the sign of your coming? And when is the world going to end? So it's three questions. The last is like two questions and one of them is two part. But I'm thinking of three questions. When is this going to happen? When is the temple going to be torn down? Uh, what's the sign of your coming? And listen, they, they had no idea about it. They didn't understand his first coming. And, and later on, he's going to start saying, well, I'm going to have to go away. And they say, well, what? 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 You're going to go away? What? And so they didn't understand that he was about to leave them, so they certainly had no concept at all. You see, the word they're using is the word parousia. Parousia. It's the word coming. And uh, it's not like going off and coming. You ever heard someone say, someone, if someone is working at a company, and suddenly they are appointed to be chairman of the board. What, you, what might you say about their journey at that country, at that uh, business? They've arrived. They've arrived. They've made it. Yeah. So that's what the word coming means. And Lord, when, when, are, when are you going to be on your throne? And we can look at you and your, your king of the world. And, and uh, we're going to say, well, he, he has come. And that, they had no idea of him going away and then coming for a second coming. The word parousia means when is it going to happen that you, everything that you intend to be, that you're going to be, when you, we can look at you and say, well, he's arrived. Now let me say that about this. Either Jesus answered their questions in these following words, or he didn't. You see what I mean? Maybe you don't, because I don't see it. Plainly. They asked him some questions, and then he's going he's to answer their questions, or, or did he? Because there's a lot of people that believe that he didn't really answer their questions, that he only gave them pieces or parts, that there's a whole lot more to it than what he told them. I believe when the Philippian jailer woke up from the earthquake there in, in Acts chapter 16, and he saw that the prison doors were burst open, he, he called for a light, and he says he fell at Paul and Silas' feet. He said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Now next, in the next verse, Paul said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you'll be saved in your house. Now Paul either told him how to be saved, or he didn't. Did you notice he didn't say anything about being baptized? Being baptized is very important. He didn't say anything about joining the church, or becoming a church member. He didn't say anything about praying or reading the Bible or repenting of your sins. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. So either he told him how to be saved, he either answered his question, or he didn't. And I want to tend to say, you know, I think that when someone is that desperate and he's that sincere, what do I have to do to be saved? You just tell him. You just tell him everything he needs and all that he needs. And there's not anything. You cut it down. You, you peel it out for him and you get it. If you want to know you just asked me a question. What do I have to do to be saved? This is it. And I believe that Paul told him. And if you if you know someone, if you ever get it, if someone ever says, "Well, how in the world could I become a Christian?" If you tell them what Paul told that man, that person can be saved instantaneously. He doesn't need anything else. We have a tendency to make salvation so complicated and so impossible to understand. You got to bow your knee and genuflate across yourself in holy water. And, uh, you know, go to the priest and confess. You know, just, 
and have the Lord's Supper, you've got to be baptized, you've got to be dipped twice or three times in the name of Jesus, or you've got to be baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And Paul says, look, if you just believe in Jesus, you're in. A lot of people call that easy believing. Wait, he, did he not answer the man's question? All right, let's go. Either Jesus answered their question. I believe what comes next is the answer to these questions. All right, that we're going to look at it. I'm going to read from my Bible here, Amy, and if you would follow me. In verse 4, it says, And Jesus answered. He did, didn't he? He answered. Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. Now, I've heard that verse misinterpreted all my life. He's not saying that there are going to be some people show up and they're going to say, I'm the Christ. That's not what that verse says. Jesus says, they're going to come in my name saying, I'm the Christ. Let me say it a different way. There are a lot of people going to come in Jesus' name saying, Jesus is the Christ. That's what that verse is saying. It's not saying a lot of pretenders are going to come pretending to be Christ. He says a lot, and then of course that's, if somebody comes up and like Charles Manson and says, I'm Jesus Christ, you just go, <laughs> But there are people who have gotten on nationwide television and say, I'm here to tell you about Jesus. And what they tell you, Jesus of Nazareth. No, I'm not Jesus of Nazareth. That's Jesus of Nazareth. He said, I want you to take heed. There are a lot of people going to come in my name, Jesus says, saying that I'm the Christ. They're going to say, yeah, Jesus is the Christ. He's the Messiah. But he says they're deceivers. That is far more treacherous. And that fools far more many, far many. You know, if someone comes around and says, well, I'm Jesus, you know that's not Jesus. He's not saying there are going to be people come and say I'm the Christ. But he says, they're going, Jesus says they're going to come in my name. And they're going to deceive a lot of people. Because they're going to point at me. They're going to point at Jesus and say, He's the Christ. You're going to deceive me. And you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. Jesus is not saying there are going to be worse wars. Are there going to be more wars than normal? He says there's just going to be a lot of war. It's going to be something that happens. And nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilence and earthquakes in many different kinds of places. Now, you can read about all of these things in the book of Acts. I'm not going to preach through the book of Acts again. All the different wars and the rumors of wars, they're, they're referred to, or at least hinted at, but that there are earthquake, earthquakes and pestilences and famines referred to in the book of Acts. He's telling these apostles, you're going to see this happen. It's going to happen in your lifetime. He said, I'm telling you, this is what's about to happen. He's not talking about things that are going to happen uh, in a million years from now. But these are the kind of things that began happening as a part of the process in his day, and they're continuing in our day. All these big things are the beginning of sorrows. Now let me ask you, there verse 8. Matthew 24, 8. Do you have another translation that instead of sorrows, what is it, does it say something different? Now, uh, all these things are the beginning of sorrows. Paul says uh, all these events are the beginning of birth pains. Birth pains. It's the word Odin. The Greek word Odin. He says this is the beginning of birth pains. He said, we're talking about, he says, I was born through Mary in a manger. He says, my second coming is going to be like a birth. It's going to be like me being born a second time. It's going to be like the, the world is going to be in labor pains. Now you men all know about that, don't you? And the experts on that? He says that at the beginning of sorrows, it says in the King James Word. But it's, it's the translation of the word O-D. And it's labor pains. He says... I remember when Carice was born that uh, 
uh, well, with Johnson too, but with Carice, uh, Terry was in a birthing room. She wasn't in a delivery room or a, a surgery room. It was like a little, it was a hospital room. And it had a birthing bed and so forth. It, it, it would do. It was like a transformer. And they put a little, uh, a little monitor on her tummy. And we had two gauges. I could look at that and listen to it. it. had a little tape that was coming out. We had two gauges. I could tell when she was having a contraction because that arrow would start going like that. And if she had a hold of my arm right here, that was the other gauge. She had a hold of my arm. And when she started having a contraction, ow, 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 ow. And we were both in pain. <laughs> like, you know, breathe it in general. <laughs> so, This, these wars, this pestilence and earthquakes, he says, it's like that. It's, it's, they're going to get closer together. And he says they're going to increase in frequency and, 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 and you know, their length of time that they last. So that's very important. Here he says, it's like a woman giving a child, giving a birth to a baby. It's the beginning of sorrows, the beginning of labor. And then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, and shall kill you, and you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. Jesus is talking to his disciples, and nearly every one of them would die a martyr's death. As a matter of fact, only one of them, when well, Judas is going to take his own life, he's in the crowd here. But only Apostle John is going to die what we would consider to be natural causes. The rest of them were crucified or stoned or sawn in two or pierced with arrows and spears. He says they're going to deliver you to be afflicted and they're going to kill you. And you should be hated of all nations for my name's sake. He's talking to these men. And it's happened to other believers since then. It's happened if you've ever read Fox's Book of Martyrs. If you read about... Uh, Martyrs today in the world. People are still dying because of the relationship to Jesus. And then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall arise and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure to the end, the same shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all the nations, and then shall the end come. So he's still he's on track. Now, in verse 15, he says, When you shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, whoever reads this, let him understand. Then let him which is in Judea flee into the mountains. He's answering another one of their, a part of their question. He's not answering them in the order that he asked them, but he feels like in the, important, in the order of importance. Jesus just said, this temple is going to be torn down. Not one stone is going to be left on top of the other. That is going to happen in A.D. 70. Only about 40, less than 40 years from when he's, he's, he's telling you this. They're going to come in and, and they're going to desecrate the temple. In Daniel, 9, in Daniel chapter 9, verse 27, it tells about the abomination of desolation. So Jesus said... This temple is going to be destroyed. And he says, it's just like Daniel said, that this, the, this great temple, Lord, look at this. Yeah, it's all going to be destroyed. That's going to happen in A.D. 7. So this is something, and most of them are still going to be alive. I would say many of them. He says, if you be in Judea, flee to the mountain. You know, there's, he's, he's not only he's talking to them, but this is really, really good advice. None of these men went to, a, there's a particular mountain. I've been on top of it a couple of times. There's a particular mountain that many in Judea fled to to get away from this very event. Do you know what that mountain is called? It's Masada. 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 It's like a big stump of a mountain out in the middle of the desert. And hundreds of people from Jerusalem fled to there and got it. Was, it, was a, it was built by Herod the Great as a fortress. 
And they got up there and, and barricaded themselves in, and the Romans couldn't get up. It's really, if, if you've got some highly armed people up at the top of the mountain and you're trying to climb up, that's ter a terrible military uh, strategy. It, it just wasn't working. They ultimately had to take tons and tons and tons and tons of dirt and wood and stumps and stones, and they built ramps, a ramp that was nearly a mile long so that they could drive their chariots up. They, they couldn't climb up through the snake trail that I walked up. They had to build a great, and part of those ramps, it took them about three and a half years to build that ramp. And they finally got up there. They couldn't climb up because they just throw stuff down on top of their heads. But when they finally got up there, the legend is that everybody up there was dead. They killed themselves. I don't believe that either. But that's not, none of that story's in the Bible. Jesus said, when that starts happening, flee to the mountains. And there's a lot of mountains in Israel. And he said, that's, that's really a smart thing to do. The only people, the most, the destruction of Jews, Jerusalem, in AD 7 by, by Titus, was one of the most terrible, you know, they had been so obnoxious and so irritating so much. When the emperor finally gave the, the, the dropped the hammer, he said, just, just kill them all. So they're just, they ain't been nothing but trouble. <laughs> they ain't been nothing but trouble. Kill them all. And it's the most terrible act of genocide that's probably ever been perpetrated by a one people. And a, the, about the only people who survived the destruction of Jerusalem and Israel were the people who fled to the mountains, who got who ran away. Let him who's on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house. He said, if it starts happening and you happen to be on top of your house, he said, you'd be better just to stay there. Don't try. You, you already messed up. It's too late for you to run to the mountains. If you, get, if you happen to be on top of your house, that's where they went to relax. So if you happen to be relaxing on top of the, on the patio upstairs and the Roman army shows up, he said, don't, don't come downstairs. Get your toothbrush. He said, you need to stay there because you done messed up. It's too late. He wasn't giving that as a strategy. He was telling them, if you happen to stay home, if you don't listen to me, if that happens to you, you're sunk. He didn't say you'd survive if you stayed on top of the house. Verse 18. Neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. They used to strip down out in the fields. Even the fishermen did that. They'd strip down to just a towel or nothing at all. They didn't want to ruin their clothes. And he says, man, if you happen to be working out in the field and the Roman army shows up with this the destruction that I'm talking about, he says, don't even go back to the house, get your clothes, just run. And warn to them that are with child and, and that give suck in those days. That's, he says, boy, it's really going to be hard for women who are carrying children who are about to give birth. It's just it's the most terrible time for them. But pray ye that your flight not be in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. Now in the winter, why would it be bad if they attacked in the winter? Just a guess, an idea. Yeah, and uh, plus food's a little scarce. You know, we go down the store. It doesn't matter. Uh, you can buy strawberries just about any time you want to all year long, or watermelons. But in their day, they just didn't have much food in the winter time. It was tough. But what about the, what if it's on the Sabbath day? Yeah, that's right, but it's also kind of the same thing. No food. Yeah. You didn't cook anything that morning. You didn't cook it. And a lot of people would prepare something so they could eat it on the Sabbath day. But a lot of people just didn't. They just decided, oh, just let it go. So he said, a lot of people just didn't. You're not, you're not all that prepared on the Sabbath day. Verse 21 says, For then shall come great tribulation. Well, let me tell you something. You're going to hear, all, all, when you study a lot about the second coming, you hear people write about and talk about and preach about and sing about the tribulation. The tribulation. The great tribulation. Well, the Bible doesn't say a word about the tribulation. There's no the tribulation. There's no the tribulation going to happen. There's no the great tribulation. But right here he says, For then shall be great tribulation. Now, what does your Bible say on that verse, Danny? Number 21. Does it use the word tribulation? Yes. Yeah. All right. Now, the word, he's still talking about birth pains. And the word tribulation is the Greek word flips this. It means pressure. Pressure. I've heard women say that's a really good ex explanation of a birth contraction. It's pressure. And then, what do they tell you to do when you're feeling that pressure? Push. 
push. <laughs> Randy, I have no idea why you know that. But um, push. In other words, we need more pressure. We need more pressure. So he says, then there's there's going to be great tribulation. He's not. He doesn't say there's going to be a great tribulation, such as what was not since the beginning of the world uh, to this time, no, nor ever shall be. Verse 22. And except those days should be shortened, there should be no flesh be saved, but the, for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. Then if any man shall, well, let me just say something. This is kind of like a physics class, and I don't want to get too deep. But I believe in the Big Bang Theory. I believe when God said, let there be light. That's, that's when everything started. And everything is still expanding from the, from the Big Bang since the creation. But something happened. Uh, several thousand years ago where our days are getting shorter and shorter. And he's not talking about something theological here or something spiritual. He is saying the days are actually getting shorter. Verse 23 says, Then if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. He says, and th that's really Nearly every, do you know that on June the 29th that Jesus was supposed to return? That, that was supposed to be the, and if you listen to YouTube and watch YouTube and listen to the internet, just about every year, every other year, there's some clown out there. Well, I saw on, uh, on Reuters this year, it says, well, biblical prophecy failed because Jesus didn't come back. I think it's June 23rd instead of 29th. Well, biblical prophecy didn't fail. It didn't go wrong. It didn't fail to come true. It's that there are people all the time they are going to say, Behold, look, this is what the day is going to come. There have been hundreds and hundreds of people. They do it all the time. They say that Jesus is coming. He's going to come on Tuesday or Friday. He's coming at 5 o'clock. Jesus right here says, Don't believe. It. Don't believe. Believe it not. Verse 24 says, For there shall rise false Christ. Now he is talking about false Christ. Several of them, four or five of them, are mentioned in the book of Acts. Gamaliel was saying, you know, there's, there's Eustace and, and uh, Justice, and there was Judas. These guys came along saying they were the Messiah. So in the book of Acts, that, that had already started happening. False prophets and show great signs and wonders insomuch that if it were possible they shall deceive the very elect. Behold, I've told you before. He said, I'm telling you. He says, this is not going to, this is not something that, uh, he said, this is something that you twelve disciples need to know about because you need, you'll, and when that happens, you'll remember that I told you. Wherefore, if they say unto you, uh, unto you, behold, he is in the desert, don't, don't go forth. Behold, he is in the secret chambers, don't believe it. There's always going to be somebody who feel, who's going to tell you that they've got the secret or the biblical knowledge or Jesus appeared to them in a, in a vision to tell them about the end of time and the end of the world. He says, remember one of the questions that the disciples asked? What shall be the sign of thy coming? He's going to give them one. He's going to say, this is the sign. He is saying, this is not the sign. They don't know the signs. The false Christ, the false prophets, the deceivers. They don't know the sign. He says, I'm about to give you the sign. They're going to tell you that they know something you don't know. They know more about the Bible than you know, and they're going to tell you about when Jesus is going to come. He says, but they're not telling you the truth. Wherefore, if they say unto you, Behold, he's in the desert, go not forth. Behold, he's in the secret chambers, believe it not. For as the lightning comes out of the east and shines even into the west, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. For wheresoever the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered together. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light. The stars shall fall upon the heavens, soft shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. Okay, verse 30, let me read it again. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. Jesus said, you want to know when I'm coming? What does he say? When you see me. You'll know I'm coming because you'll see me. That's what he says. Then shall appear the sign. That's, that's, when, what's the sign of your coming? When you see me coming, you'll know I'm coming. 
But don't believe anybody else. And don't believe any. If you've got a formula, if you've got a graph or a chart, you are looking at the moon and the sun and the stars and how the planets are in alignment, he says, that's not it. Let me tell you, you can know exactly when Jesus is coming back. When you look up in the sky and you see him, just punch the next person to you and say, hey, Jesus is coming. See? And you'll be right. But anybody else that tells you differently until then, Jesus said, here's the sign. Here's the sign. He, they got a lab, but they all lean for it. Well, here it is. The sign. He says, when you look up in the sky and you see me, that's it. And the earth shall mourn. They shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. That's what I'm going to do that day. And when I see Jesus coming, I'm going to say, I'm about to make a prophecy. There He is. He's coming. And somebody, and somebody say, Amen. You, preacher, I believe you're right. I believe you hit the nail on the head. He's coming. There He is. He's going to come in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And He shall send His angels with a great sound of the trumpet. And they shall gather together His elect from the four winds and from the end of the heaven to the other. Now learn a parable of the fig tree. He talks about the parable of the fig tree. Now look down to verse 36. Need to move on. Need to finish up. I'm not going to do all of this. Verse 36, Matthew 24, 36 says, But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. As the days of Noah were, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. Now a lot of people have made a lot of a lot about this. It's going to be like it was in Noah's day. The whole point of saying they were marrying and giving in marriage and they were, they, were, they were eating and drinking. What he is saying is they're just going to be doing normal stuff. They're just going to be going to work and going to school. They're going to be eating and drinking. He says, and he says they didn't know it was going to rain till when? Till it started raining. Till it started raining. That's what he says right here. Look at verse 39. They knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. They didn't know it was going to rain until it started raining. And then it took them all away. Jesus said, that's the way my coming is going to be. You're not going to know and I'm not going to know. Nobody's going to know when Jesus is coming back until one day you look up and you see Him coming. Now that may sound foolish, but Jesus is saying, people are going to try to trick you and deceive you and try to tell you something different. But he says, it's just really that simple. Look at verse 40. There are going to be two in a field and one shall be taken and the other left. He says the angels are going to be gathering people up. Do you remember how Jesus said, he's already told them what it's going to be like. He says the kingdom of God is like this. A man who divided what? His sheep from his goats, and the wheat from the tares. He says there's going to be there's going to be two working in a field, and he's going to separate them. They're going to be split apart. Two women should be grinding at the mill, and one should be taken the other left. Watch therefore, for you know not what hour the Lord comes. But know this: that if the good man of the house had known in what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. Therefore, be ready, for in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man comes. Let's close. Look on your, your chart there. I didn't want to use one thing on it. Jesus is not coming again twice. He's not coming part of the way. But in every one of these tellings of the coming of Christ, it only tells about one. This, this one tells about one coming. This one that we just read. This one tells about one coming. This one, this All of them. They never, if there are two, it only talks about one and doesn't mention the other one at all. There's not another one. They're all talking about the coming of Christ and there's only one. He's not going to come halfway, snatch up all the church and then go back and come back later. Let me show you why. Look here at the second column. Acts chapter 1. Now, this is not, this is actually not directly talking. This is, a, this is talking about the ascension right after the resurrection. 40 days after the resurrection. This is when Jesus went back to heaven. But it tells you something very, very, very important about the second coming. There's a reference here to the second coming. 
Jesus is there on the Mount of Olives. They've been seeing Him on and off for 40 days after the resurrection. And there He is on the Mount of Olives. I have stood, there. they said there's a footprint, an indentation of a stone there on top of the Mount of Olives. They've got a, a church built around it. So an odd little church, it's probably just about as big around as this little place right here. Brown, or not brown, but it's conical, and has a hole in the ceiling. It's a church, but it, there's no place to sit down. You just ring the walls. Stone floor made out of stone, stone roof. And there's a, a little square place there, and it's got a stone in the middle of it. And look, if you, if you look at it just like that, it looks like a footprint. They say, that's where Jesus, that's where he took off from. I don't know if it was there, but I got chills all over my body. I said, man, this is where he lifted off from. He went back to heaven. You can look up through there like that. They had candles all around that little box. I had the audacity to go stand in. I was like, I won't stand in. Take my picture. And I did. Terry took my picture. And a lot of gall, man. I don't care, man. Jesus don't mind. See if I had any spring to it. I, take, I like to take off. And the disciples are kept on watching. And all of a sudden, someone spoke to him. They looked down, and there were two, two men dressed in white standing there. And they said this, You men of Galilee, you men of Galilee, why stand you here gazing into the heavens? This same Jesus, he's going to return in like manner as you've seen him depart. Now, when Jesus comes back, you just play that in your mind. There's Jesus, you know, on Mount of Olives. He goes up to heaven. He's with his disciples. He's going up to heaven. And they've said, let me tell you something. This is exactly the way Jesus is going to come back. He's not going to come halfway. He's going to come all the way down. Just like he was playing it backwards. He's going to come down from the sky, and he's going to come down here to planet Earth. It's Jesus is going to return. He's going to return just like that. Now, there's a lot of people, they add about a thousand and one different things that has to happen or that's going to happen. There are really only two things that, that the Bible says. The Bible says you're only going to know that Jesus is coming and when He comes, you'll, you'll know He's coming because you'll see Him coming. That's the only way to figure it out. Don't look for anything else. There's no other sign. That's the sign. Look for Him when you see Him coming. The second thing is, he's going to come just like he lived. He's going to appear in the sky, and it's going to be just like he was playing the Mount of Olives ascension in reverse. He's going to come all the way down, and he's going to come down and put his foot on the Mount of Olives. Now in that process, we're going to be caught up together. Those who are, those who are dead are going to be raised while he's coming down. And they're going to be, he's going to be bringing the, soul, the saints of those who have already passed on. He'll be bringing them with him. Paul says, we who are alive and remain are going to be caught up together to meet him in the air. And just like they met Paul and escorted him into Rome, if I'm alive when Jesus comes, I'm going to say, there he is. And you and I are going to take off. Paul said, those of us who are alive and remain are going to be caught up together to meet him in the air. And then we're going to escort him back down here to planet Earth. And just like he left, he's going to come back. Not two stages, three stages, no seven-year tribulation, no thousand-year wait for this or that, no antichrist tearing up dock, no intrigue and prophetic declarations with the Jewish people. It's very, very simple. And that's what each one of these say. It's going to be the next thing. There's nothing else that needs to happen. There's, there's nothing else on... Some people think, well, the temple has to be rebuilt or... Uh, they, they thought it was important for Israel to be declared a nation again. Listen, Israel, if you wake up in the morning and you hear on the news that the nation of Israel has been completely destroyed by an atomic bomb or by some Arab nation, don't worry about it. Whenever in the Old Testament, whenever there was a restoration, there was a repentance and a return to God, and God restored the nation of Israel. It was always of that nature. There is no spiritual revival. There's no restoration. The people of Israel, nearly every Jew that 
that you meet in the land of Israel were atheists. They don't believe in God. They gave up on God during the Holocaust. There's no great spiritual revival. There are some tr true believers in God in, in the nation of Israel. But the nation itself is just a secular nation. I don't believe that the regathering of Israel after World War II was the fulfillment of any kind of prophecy. Because the people of God, the children of God today, is the church. We are Israel. You'll see throughout the book of Revelation, John says, well, let me just say a word or two about those who say that they are Jews and are not. You and I are the children of Abraham. You and I are the seed of Isaac. You and I are the children of grace and the children of promise. We are those who receive Jesus as the Messiah. He's the Christ. He's our Savior. He's our Lord. And those the people are going to find grace from God. And that's the only ones. Only in Christ alone. Well, that's a lot to study about. A lot to sort through if you care to, if it means anything to you. But I do not tell people that when they hear the trumpet sound, don't worry about it. You've got seven years of tribulation. You can pedal around. Get saved anytime you want to. What I tell people is, if you ever look up in the sky and you see Jesus coming, you're toast. You're done. You're lost. You have no hope. Because He's not coming down to give an invitation. He's already took names. <laughs> Saw a bumper sticker one time. I can't really say what He exactly said. But He says, Jesus is coming back. And boy, is He mad. Jesus is coming back, and boy, is he mad. He's not going to be the suffering servant or the simple savior when he comes. He's going to be the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And the Bible says, Jesus said, when I come back, the earth is going to mourn. It's going to mourn. Well, I'm going to hold my breath until Bible school starts. I'm not going to sleep any this week. Worry and wring my hands, wonder. If you, but I, I shouldn't do that because there I'm going to be to a great extent absent, and there are people here they are going to be working very hard, and there's a lot to do, be done to get ready and to prepare and to decorate. Uh, we'll be ready Saturday morning. We'll be ready, and uh, it, we're going to have a good school. We're going to there's. I've, I've seen more people come to know Jesus in Vacation Bible School than I have revivals or camps or conferences or anything like that. And so many people that I have baptized have been, I've seen come to know the Lord can say, I met Jesus in Bible School. It was one of the greatest factors in my young Christian life. When our family hardly ever went to church, we never missed vacation Bible school. There's some kids going to be here Saturday who don't go to church anywhere or they don't go much. So even if there's just one or two or three or four, we have a chance. And, uh, you know, my two granddaughters, I'm thinking, man, even if they're the only ones here, that'd be it. One of these days, they're going to give their life to Christ. And it'll be because of the Walnut Grove Baptist Church because of what you have done and who you are and how you've loved them and ministered to them. All right? God bless you. Be careful out there. Look